Welcome back. In this example, we're going to analyze the domain and range of a given two-variable function. Here we have the function, the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared, and we're asked to analyze the domain and range. To begin our solution, let's recall the anatomy of a radical expression. When we read this radical expression, the thing sitting up here on the little table stand is called the index of the radical. This squiggly symbol right here is a symbol of hope in the city of Gotham, aka the root symbol. And if you were really excited about life, you could call it the radical symbol, dude, because it's so radical, man. It's totally gnarly. gnarly. The thing inside we call the radicand. You could also call this the argument of the root or the radical. When we look at an index of 2, we know that the radicand A must be bigger than or equal to 0 because there's no such thing as a square root of a negative number. That's what that's saying. When you take the square root of something, the only way that makes sense in the real numbers, excuse me, is if the radicand is positive. Of course, there's something called complex analysis, which is just so beautiful, but that's outside the scope of this class. The moment that we know this, we want to say that the domain of our function, in this case, the function is called g, is going to be equal to the set of valid inputs. Well, what would it mean to be a valid input? It would mean that I have x comma y such that the radicand, aka 4 minus x squared minus y squared, is bounded below by 0. Well, what would that set be? This is the set of all inputs such that 4 bounds above x squared plus y squared. And notice that x squared plus y squared, these are going to be non-negative numbers. In other words, the sum of two squares would be bounded below by 0. That's not really important for the domain analysis, since we already know um, a little bit about that implicitly. However, I think it's worth noticing. If we were to graph this, this means that the domain of our function g is the disk with radius r equal to the square root of 4 because of the way that circles work. And you could do a quick graph of this by hand, much better to do with Mathematica. I agree with you audience members at home. But the graph would look something like this. You would have a circle with radius 2, which is the boundary there. And then the domain just happens to be not only do we have that boundary, but we have every point inside because this is an inequality, not a strict equality. So the boundary in black here would be when x squared plus y squared was exactly equal to 4. And the red interior region would be when x squared plus y squared was strictly less than 4, which means that the entire domain is that disk. The circle is the boundary of that disk. Wow, that's so specific. OK, now let's look at the range of our, our function g, which we said was going to be the set of output value z such that z is equal to f of x comma y for x comma y element of our domain. How do we analyze this situation? Well, we know that if z is equal to g of x comma y, this implies immediately that z is equal to the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared by the original definition. 
We also know that this is going to be bounded below by 0 because the radicand, the thing inside, we've already said that this is going to get no less than 0. And the square root is a monotonically increasing function. In fact, if we look at the graph of the square root function, whatever this is, let's call this uh, the square root of a, for example, and we'll call this a. This graph will start at 0. It will never drop below 0. And it will go up like a sideways parabola. It's not the best sideways parabola I've ever graphed, but it's not the worst one either. right? So it's kind of, if you flipped it on its side, you'd actually get a parabola there. And what that means is the lowest this, that whatever this a value is inside is going to be, when you take the square root, it would not get less than 0. And then notice also that since we have our upper bound, we knew that from the domain, um, 4 minus x squared minus y squared would have to be greater than or equal to 0. And this meant that uh, 4 was less than or equal to x squared minus, excuse me, x squared plus y squared. And we've just seen that um, based on our domain, the lower bound for that is 0. And we can do something kind of fun here, which is we can multiply the entire inequality by a negative. When we multiply inequalities by negatives, the direction of the inequality flips. And then if we add 4 to every single one of these expressions on either side of the inequality, we get something that looks like this. And now if we take the square root of all this, one thing that you have to um, kind of know, this is a lemma as a side note. If you have two non-negative numbers, and the bounds on the negative numbers are a is less than b, I'm going to make a claim, then the square root of a must be less than or equal to the square root of b. That claim is actually um, hidden in this graph up here. Perhaps you have some point a and some point b. If you looked at the square root of a, I should have used a different variable here because I'm using a as both a dummy and a specific. But the point is, this dot, if your inequality is like this, would be lower than the dot having to do with the larger number. And that's because the square root is the inverse operation of a parabola. And on the particular domain of the parabola, uh, this thing happens to be monotonically increasing, blah, blah, blah. OK, so it, when we look at the square root function, we can apply the entire thing. Here I've got the square root of 0. In the middle, this is the exact function I'm looking for, which is 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And then over here, I have the square root of 2. And this gives me, da, 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 da. oh, sugar. Of course, I meant the square root of 4. And then this gives me a range for my g of x values, because this right here was g of x. We've massaged it into the exact form that we want. So we know now that the range of g is the set touching 0 going no larger than 2. Let's go ahead and boot up Mathematica and see if we can confirm this, these two conjectures that we've made looking at the graph of this function. Here I am in Mathematica. I've titled my notebook and saved it as Lesson 7 Examples. I've saved it into my uh, lesson note folder on my computer. I'm going to go ahead and define our function g of x. When I define the function g, I go ahead and use lowercase because it is a non-native Mathematica function. I also put underscores to represent that these are going to be input variables. And I use the delayed uh, assignment operator to say, please don't actually evaluate this at the moment. I'm going to go ahead and push Control 2, which gets me a square root. And then in this case, we said that this was 4 minus x squared. And of course, we had minus y squared as well. We made a claim that this was going to have a domain from 0 to 4. We noticed that this is an explicit function, which means we're going to use the plot3d command. 
go ahead and open and close brackets and we'll name the close bracket. Uh, for those of you that didn't hear this story, I have spent about 20 hours of my life um, debugging. Oh, excuse me, of course this is a plot 3D. And at the end of that 20 hours, it was quite a long uh, bit of code. There were about four or five different sub um, documents that I was working with. And at the end of the 20 hours debugging, I ended up having one issue, which was I couldn't find the other uh, closed bracket. So 20 hours of my life for a non-closed bracket. Please, please, please use my stupid mistake as inspiration to make you a better person. When you open a bracket, immediately close the bracket and also use indentation as a way to uh, figure out where things start and end. And you'll see me code this in all the videos. Um, so let's go ahead and look. We said that the domain should be anywhere between uh, zero and four for X and Y. Um, so, oh, excuse me, we said it should be the disk between zero and two, didn't we? So this should be uh, negative two, of course, and two. And then the y would also be uh, negative two and two because of the way that that works out. And let's go ahead and graph that sucker. Yep, that looks about right. Um, because it, indeed, if you were to take the square onto the other side, this would be a hemisphere. Uh, let's go ahead and change the plot style. So we'll say plot style and we'll do directive. Each plot has its own directive. It's, you can think about these like its own attributes, the way that we want it to be. I usually like blue, uh, that's been the style in these videos. And then we'll also do um, opacity. And let's do 50% opacity so we can see through it a little bit. Um, and then let's we can turn off the mesh if you like, it doesn't really matter. But there's that one. And you notice that uh, Mathematica has automatically done my plot range for me. I'm going to go ahead and um, test the plot range that we got analytically. So plot range, uh, we said that this was going to be 0 to 2. And let's go ahead and extend this just to see that indeed it doesn't extend beyond 2. Yep, see it? And we could do something fun, which is we could point to the maximum value, which would happen when x and y are 0. right? And that would be right at the top edge of that plot. That's kind of a nice thing. It's a hemisphere, half sphere. All right. In the next video, we're going to start talking about contour curves and see some graphs of contour curves in three dimensions. See you in the next video.